Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Noongar people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I want to congratulate the Melba uh, member for Albany, uh, Peter Watson, on his election as Speaker and, of course, to yourself as you, um, on your election as Deputy Speaker. I congratulate the Premier, Mark McGowan, on leading an emphatic victory for WA Labor and all of the newly elected members in this place. I was motivated by a number of things to run for the seat uh, for Labor. The total, oh. Just making sure my seats, my speech is in order. I am in the fortunate position of making my second inaugural speech, though I'm a little bit less nervous this time. Coming from the Legislative Council, I'm quite practised at making long, meandering speeches, and I'll try to contain myself for this one. I am really thrilled to stand as the member for Morley in this place. It is a particular thrill to be here with so many other Labor members of the McGowan Labor government. I'm excited about the next four years and what we can all achieve together. My recent election to the Assembly has been a real journey for me, having spent the previous Parliament in the Legislative Council as the member for East Metro. Picking up the East Metro spot for Labor in 2013, a very difficult election for us, was in some ways unexpected. I was at that time Acting Assistant Secretary of United Voice and would very happily have continued down that path. It was a very eventful four years, both personally and professionally, for me. I said in my valedictory speech in the other place that I was hoping for a quieter few years. Well, I've changed my mind. I want the next few years in government to be exciting, busy and productive while we all work together to implement our agenda. I've got a strong connection with the community and electorate of Morley, which in fact takes in the suburbs of Morley, Noranda, Dianella and Nolamara. The suburb of Morley is in fact split across four electorates. My parents bought their first house on Guildford Road in Bayswater. Indeed, my father still lives there. I spent a large portion of my childhood growing up there, attending local schools, with a number of memorable moments. I smoked my first cigarette at the bus stop outside John Forrest Senior High School. I won't tell you how old I was, Mum. I got hit by a car outside the old Molly bus station, running for a bus and instead ending up in an ambulance, and I generally spent too much time hanging out at the then brand new Galleria in the late 1980s. <laughs> I was motivated by a number of things to run for the seat for Labor. The total lack of development in the nearly 30 years since I was at high school and the broken promises of the previous government in relation to the much needed improvements in public transport. The strong connection I built with local PNCs, community groups and residents as the upper house member and of course my family and I live there and we love it. It was a risky strategy moving from a held spot in the upper house to run in what was a liberal seat against a two term incumbent but I firmly believed it was the right thing to do for the community and the Labor Party. To win government we had to win Morley so I put myself forward as a genuine alternative to the electorate and gladly it paid off. It must be said, this was not a task I undertook on my own. I had huge amounts of support from many quarters here today, and I will go over that later. Morley is a great area. It's close to the CBD and the river, lots of diversity in local businesses, great schools and strong areas of community. The suburbs in the seat are quite distinctly different in character and there are some challenges and I'll talk a little bit about each of these. Morley, whilst mostly residential, has a very strong commercial district with many small and medium sized businesses owned by local people. However, it is underserviced by public transport and suffers from chronic congestion. The Walter Road Wellington intersection is a shocker and frankly choking local businesses. People who live close to the commercial area around Galleria actually go elsewhere for their shopping to avoid this nightmare. The area lacks cycle paths, integrated public transport, pedestrian zones and of course a train. In Morley the car is king and you take your life into your hands when walking around and crossing local roads. Navigating it safely with a pram or wheelchair is virtually impossible. 
I am excited about the prospect of actually developing this area into a modern thriving hub over the next 30 years. Naranda is a peaceful suburb with beautiful parks, though the imposing North Link Freeway is changing that for many residents in both Morley and Naranda. I don't think anyone truly understood the scale and local impact of this enormous road. There is of course no doubt it will benefit local businesses and ease congestion, but it threatens the ongoing viability of at least one local school, a key environmental asset, and in many instances will push more cars onto quiet residential streets. There seems a culture of over-engineering many of these projects where a single interchange appears to take over a good portion of a suburb, that these road engineering principles dare not be challenged, regardless of what bush, forest, houses or existing community infrastructure might be in the way. We must look at smarter options for these projects and make more effort towards making them more sympathetic to the existing environment. Both Naranda and Dianella, despite being close to the transport hub of Morley, are public transport black holes. These suburbs are geographically spread out, and unless you live close to a major road like Banara Road or Alexander Drive, you can't catch a bus. Dianella, where I lived until very recently, I now live at the Morley end of the electorate, is also a very peaceful suburb, but not a cycle path to be seen, a missed opportunity given its proximity to the city. Residents tell me they crave more vibrancy and activation of local areas, and I have to agree. It's also worth noting that a recent national survey had Dianella as one of the suburbs suffering the worst mortgage stress across the country. The unemployment rate and job insecurity is really biting even middle-income areas. Another area suffering in the current economic climate is Nolamara, which has almost doubled the state average of unemployment. I love Nolamara for its diversity, uh, for its previous member, uh, uh, for its mix of new arrivals and people who have lived there more than 30 years. Recent overdevelopment of blocks without the adequate supporting infrastructure has created some social and practical challenges for residents. In all, it's a great area to represent in, in which I live and I hope to look over the speech at the end of my time as the member for Morley, whenever that may be, and see that we've addressed many of these issues. I've always believed in public life in being open about what you believe in, to outline the set of principles by which I will be guided when making decisions in this place. I am and have always been a strong believer in choice, that women and women alone have the right to determine their reproductive outcomes. This hard-fought right was consistently undermined by the previous Liberal gov National Government through its privatisation of Midland Hospital to a Catholic provider, its systemic tightening of funding and bureaucratic processes which significantly limited access to plan family planning and termination services to women in our state, in particular regional areas. Choice doesn't end there. It also applies to birth choices. Compared to most countries, WA women have limited access to a range of safe birthing choices. The World Health Organisation states ideal rates of caesarean section should be around between 10 and 15 per cent. On 2013 figures, health department figures, the WA C-section rate was around 34 per cent, with one private hospital at a staggering 55 per cent. We compare poorly internationally. There are many countries that have managed to keep their caesarean rate low, despite facing the same medical issues that Australia does. The emphasis on medical intervention has undermined the confidence of women's own ability to give birth naturally. I also believe, at the other end of life, that we should have the ability to make our own end of life choices when faced with chronic and terminal illness. The circumstances in which we currently allow our loved ones to die frankly lacks humanity. I support marriage equality. This is so overdue that frankly we just need to get on with it and end this discrimination. To my good friends in same-sex relationships, both with and without children, I think you should be able to experience the joys and misery of marriage and divorce just like the rest of us <laughs> if you choose to. The reason I joined the Labor Party was because I felt then and still do feel strongly about working people's rights, equality, access to education, health and services regardless of your income, postcode or birth circumstances. I am a product of the government education system. 
If we do not address the current appalling equity issues around gender, it will remain a fact that our daughters, when they graduate from university, if that is what they choose to do, will immediately earn less than their male counterparts. That gap will widen further as they progress in the workplace. They will have less opportunities to senior positions and promotions. Our daughters will have less superannuation. And all of these factors mean that they will have a higher reliance on government support in the older, older years and a high likelihood that they will end up in poverty and or stuck in an unhealthy and dangerous relationship. Economic independence for our girls should not simply be a lofty ideal. So much is at stake here that it should be viewed as an essential outcome of any government when measuring its success. Pay equity and equal access to economic opportunity are the keys to this success. While women's participation in higher education and paid work has increased, industrial segregation remains entrenched. According to the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, the most senior roles are heavily male dominated, with only 37 per cent of management categories for females. Australian women are in part-time employment at three times the rate of men, and not by choice. A recent report by Conrad Liveris on the analysis of ABS data shows that for every underemployed man between 25 and 34, there are four women who are underemployed. So when women are not being paid less than their male counterparts, they are clustered in low paid professions like cleaning, childcare, aged care, and even in those professions they're screaming for full time work, and the majority are unable to get it. A couple of weeks ago I was chatting to one of the cleaners at Hale House. She's a registered nurse in an aged care facility. Registered nursing requires extensive study. It's a very skilled profession. Even then, she supplements her income with cleaning because she can't get enough hours in an aged care facility. Along with a daughter, I have a son, and like all mums, I worry about his future. Women are not the only ones struggling in the new and emerging employment markets. Young people are bearing the brunt of the significant trend downwards from full-time jobs. When I started my career, after graduating 20 years ago, it was a given that if you got a job, it would be full time. Not so now. Many supplement their income with hospitality and cleaning. This impedes their ability to even rent, let alone buy a property, get finance for a car, or plan for their futures. Being 40, sadly, I'm no longer considered young and have been guilty of the odd eye roll at young people. But we should not be in no doubt as to the challenges faced by young people today. It is more expensive than ever to access higher education or training, and no matter what level you are educated to, it is harder to obtain a job which will actually cover your living expenses. We need an economy which supports everyone. I spoke to so many Conservative voters recently over the election period who themselves feel the economy has tipped too far away from ordinary people. That, it, that we as decision makers have not focused enough on the things that impact people's lives directly. It is an important role of government to curb some of the harsher aspects of capitalism on the population while supporting growth and job creation. We can do both. That is why now, in particular, is such an important time for our state to have a Labor government. <coughs> Labor can innovate in ways necessary to stimulate and diversify the economy and only Labor will do so while protecting the most vulnerable from the harsher aspects of this brutal economic environment we find ourselves in. I want to touch on the Parliament itself and the abject lack of progress and reform made in the past nine years. Every organisation has to evolve and reform if it, we are to remain relevant and to survive, and the Parliament is no exception to that. In the last term, I was forced to resign from a committee to take leave to have my baby in order to have another member replace me from that time, all because of one antiquated standing order. Despite months, yes, months of negotiation, the Liberals in the upper house refused at the last minute to agree to a simple amendment which would have allowed the temporary substitution of a member mid-inquiry, whether it be absence from maternity leave or illness or any other reason. Demanding someone resign from a position to take maternity leave is illegal in the real world. If an employer did this, we would expect them to suffer the full force of the law. And backfilling someone on leave is a scenario that is dealt with every day in workplaces. Yet these simple concepts were beyond the Parliament of Western Australia. 
I have no doubt there is some internal eye-rolling about me banging on about this again. Well, I can assure members I will go on and on and on until it is addressed. If, if we are truly to represent, we must be prepared to support diversity. Now I will get to the inevitable call for breastfeeding in the chamber. As MPs, we have to return to Parliament quick, quick smart after a baby, often within weeks, and that is our choice. Ironically, the government has a strong policy of supporting breastfeeding in maternity hospitals, yet we make it entirely prohibitive in the parliament. It is a point of deep sadness for me that my son stopped breastfeeding when I returned to parliament. Despite the constant awful expressing, it simply doesn't work. There seems some irrational fear from members, particularly on the other side, that to allow this reform will turn the chamber into some sort of chaotic crèche. It already is. <laughs> Indeed, it will probably lift the standard. In reality, it will be used by one or two members with young infants on occasion in order for them to participate in important debates or divisions. It's been suggested that we have a pair system for that. This is simply another way of excluding nursing mothers. Why should we be shunted off into a quiet room while the important business carries on without us? In Australia, a number of parliaments have successfully grappled with this and moved to address the issue. The House of Representatives, the Senate, as does the ACT parliaments, Tasmania and the New South Wales Le Legislative Council. Internationally, Iceland, Spain and the EU parliament, Argentina are all examples of uh, parliaments allowing breastfeeding in the chamber. I also support the concept of a family room up here. The family nights in the dining room are delightful, but totally impractical. You have, uh, your other half has to get a suit on, get dressed up, get the kids up here, bring them up at the worst time of day, sit nicely in the dining room, and then you send them off home to deal with all the fallout of tired and cranky children while you stay here for the rest of the night. <laughs> while that might suit some members, <laughs> it doesn't suit everyone. And these changes are small, and frankly, the community expects it. It's not about looking after ourselves. It's about broadening our appeal to those who may wish to run for parliament in the future, instead of self-selecting early out of the process because it's too hard. I'm optimistic about the, the prospect of changes in this place with the election of a new speaker and soon president, and so many women in the parliament. Sadly, for the Parliament, the vast majority of new women are only on the Labor side, which is not good overall for democracy. There are so many people to thank, and it's really hard to know where to start. Many, many people supported my journey. I want to thank United Voice members for their incredible support of both myself and so many other people who sit here today. The political process is heavily stacked against working people, particularly low-paid working people. Yet they are the ones who most often bear the brunt of government and economic decisions. These people should have a voice. Oh. Uh, Acting Deputy Speaker, I seek a short extension. Uh, extension granted. As a union representing mostly low-paid women, facing a relentless drive to lower wages, strip penalty rates and reduce working conditions in a demanding economy, you are the only thing that stands between members and minimum wage poverty. I'm proud to work with all of you now and into the future. It's important to me to have a good network of support, particularly of women. Carolyn Smith and Sue Lyons are always a source of incredible support and two women in the labour movement I have admired for many years. You have taught me to be fearless, not to back down when you believe deeply in something and you've always got my back. There are not too many people I trust to boss me around effectively, and Sue, as my campaign director, you did an outstanding job, keeping us accountable, on target, and lifting us up when we needed it. To Cheryl Davenport, my Emily's List mentor, a legendary Labor woman, though I'm sure she'll be embarrassed by me saying so, you have left a true legacy in Western Australia, and I hope I can make even a portion of a difference to people's lives in my time in this place. Patrick Gorman and Linda Oshalem, the leadership team at party office, I have to say you led an outstanding campaign and congratulations to you. The sheer volume of people we spoke to over the last year attests to the kind of campaign we ran. It was a positive campaign focused on people and the community responded strongly to it. Thank you to Tom Bayer for the relentless door knocking and phone schedule and the kilos that I lost in the process. 
Also, your willingness to get out there yourself and push us all hard. Though, I did think I pulled rank once when you were insisting on taking our volunteers out in hurricane conditions. <laughs> To all of the incredible local volunteers, too many to name, you came out in the pouring rain and 40 degree heat and humidity. It has been such a pleasure getting to know you all and none of this is possible without you. I look forward to a long friendship with you all over the coming years. My good friend Lisa Deust, who door knocked with me for the past 12 months, I cannot tell you how much I value your constant, steady friendship and support. Alicia Anderson and Mishka, campaign dog, thank you for lifting us all up when we needed it and your outstanding navigation of digital media. For Dominic Rose and Naomi McLean, who've been, been with me since I entered the council in 2013, my decision to run from Morley meant deep uncertainty for you both, but was met with nothing but excitement and support. I've loved working with you both over the last few years, and you simply cannot put a value on knowing that things are well looked after and special thanks to keeping everything going when I had my son and allowing me that short space to really enjoy him for the early days. Dom, I've been lucky to work with such a good friend. I've become so accustomed to seeing you every day and working with you that your absence has left a big hole. For Kate and Julian, my long-suffering parents, Mum, I know you would not have chosen politics for me. It's a rough business, but you guys have always supported me in every aspect of my life. It's ironic that it isn't really until you become a parent that you yourself really understand what your parents do for you, and you've been incredible parents. My partner, Phil, who I've known more than 20 years, that is a long time to know someone before getting to know them on a different level. Sometimes I think we've crammed 20 years of life events into the past three, but there is no better person to share it with, and you've brought warmth and humour and joy into mine and Chloe's lives. There's no doubt it is hard going doing this job and having a young family for us and our partners. I made the decision to run for Morley when I was around seven months pregnant with our son. I could have stayed in the upper house and in many ways it would have suited our family life better. But you never hesitated in your support and that is not to say that it's always easy for you. The unpredictable nature of both politics and small children means these two are not comfortably matched but we tackle the daily challenges together on an equal footing and I feel very lucky to share my life with you and have your support to follow my dreams. My daughter Chloe, you came along at just the right time. You brought sunshine into my life when it was most needed, watching you grow into a funny, smart, too smart sometimes, gorgeous girl is a delight. And my son Hugo, such a happy soul, you've brought us all together with your cuddles and fun and take the sting out of any bad day. My children are a constant reminder of what is really important. And ultimately, thank you to the voters of Morley for putting your faith in me as your representative. Particular thanks to the many long-term Liberal voters who supported me at this election. Tis not a task I undertake lightly. I can't say that I will be perfect, but I will give it everything I have and do the very best that I can for you and our community.